Uh, but without further ado, I would love to now introduce you to our speaker for this evening. We are very, very fortunate to have Sarah Bridal um, providing a real overview of the work that she's currently doing. Sarah is a professor of food, climate and society at the University of York and author of Food and Climate Change. Without the hot air. Great title. Sarah leads Take a Bite Out of Climate Change Project and is a member of the DEFRA-led Food Data Transparency Partnership, specifically the Eco Working Group. She leads on metrics for Fix Our Food and co-leads the UK RI Agri-Food for Net Zero Network, AFN Network. And so we really welcome you this evening, Sarah, and we can't wait to hear your presentation. Your slides are up and you're good to go. Over to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Christina. And um, thanks to everyone at City for inviting me and for all of you for showing up. I can see 73 participants already. Um, so yes, I can't see you, but I'm, I'm picturing you all there um, and typing into the chat shortly because I'm going to ask you a few questions to sort of increase my knowledge about, you know, what you guys are thinking, but also mostly to stimulate your questions. Um, so it's not really a test, it's, it's just more about uh, trying, to, trying to get you engaging and, and so that I can see where you are at, at with this. So I'm just um, overviewing, I've just listed topics that I may or may not have time to talk about all of them. I'm going to start um, talking about uh, food and civil unrest and the impact of food on climate change. And then depending on time, then um, we may or may not get a chance to, to go into detail on the other topics. But if you want to know more about them, then I'm really happy to talk about them in the, in the chat um, afterwards in the, in the Q&A, if you've got any questions about them. So I'm just going to start with this um, rather depressing topic of food and civil unrest, um, with the goal of trying to sort of, you know, gauge how much we should be doing on this topic and how we might go about doing that. So I'm going to ask you some questions because I'm really curious. This, this all arose from sort of, um, well, it's about three years ago now, two, two years ago now, we put in a grant application and the grant um, uh, call specifically said crazy ideas that you're really interested in, but that you think are you know not really that fundable from other funding sources. So I'm kind of like fascinated by what's going to happen in the next 50, 100 years and you know, the potential for um, climate change, particularly to cause civil unrest in this country. And a couple of years ago, that seemed like quite a crazy thing to be talking about. So we put the grant application in, we got the grant. Um, and really this project then um, working with people, including um, colleagues um, at City, um, was really just to sort of get a sense of how important people think this topic is and really where to start, start thinking about it. So the first question that we put to uh, about 58 um, food system experts was, um, do you think that there's going to be major civil unrest in the UK? Um, and we asked on two different time scales. So first we asked in the next 10 years, do you think that we're going to have civil unrest, which is about 10 times greater than um, previous civil unrest in the UK, for example, the London riots in 2011? So we're talking like one in 2000 people being injured. So I want to know what you think. So um, I'd like you to type into the chat um, A, B, C, D or E, where A is you think it's very unlikely that we're going to have civil unrest in the UK in the next 10 years. Thanks, Andrea. Um, uh, or unlikely, possible, more likely than not, or very likely. And I can see loads of numbers coming in, letters coming in already. C, B, E, B, D, C. Excellent. Uh, and I like the way that people can type in extra things like Karen's done there, um, if, they're, if they're wanting to say more than just a letter. So we've got, oh, it's quite a range, really. We've got quite a few Bs, but we've also got some Es. I'm going to say on average it's a C. But um, that's really interesting. And thank you for participating. It's great to know that you're all there. Uh, Corinne Bell says, I can't work out why we're not rioting in the streets now. Well, I mean, I think this is, comes down to a lot of the perception of, of whether there's a crisis, doesn't it? Because um, if we're thinking that if we look at some of the statistics on nutrition or um, food insecurity, then th there is a, a there is a crisis, clearly. But then um you know do we do we do we riot at the sign at the sign sign of there being something long term that's wrong or is it when there's a, a, a when there's perceived to be a short-term change 
so that's brilliant thank you all very much and i'm going to say that i think on average probably there's about a c but there's a few e's in there as well i noticed and a few b's and d's so i'm going to go um to the next slide where i'm going to show what the 58 food system experts that we asked for this um was so i think um actually sorry i need to apologize this is upside down from the previous so so this is a here and then we've got some b's c's and they're not really so many E's on that, but there was a few E's in the chat. So I'm curious, I'd like to know more from some of you about, about what you're thinking there. Um, I'm, I'm certainly concerned about it. And I think also I should mention, we did this in May and um, obviously political events have, have moved on quite a lot since May in the world. So um, that's also probably relevant. Excellent. Okay, I'm gonna ask the same question now, but a 50 year time scale. So um, who thinks it's very unlikely a, B, unlikely, C, possible, D, more likely than not, E, very likely, we're going to have the same sort of civil unrest over the next 50 years. I can see new messages coming in. Okay, it's, oh, I've lost track of where one question ended and the other question started, but the new ones that are coming in now are definitely lots of Ds. There's a C and E, E, C, D, yeah, okay, so there's not a lot of A's and B's, that's for sure. I don't see any coming in. Fantastic. Okay, right. I'm going to reveal the uh, results from this uh, survey that we did. So if we're looking at the 50 year time scale, then we've got E's and D's there and we've got quite a lot of C's. So I think actually you're possibly slightly more pessimistic. Um, is this a ah, very good question, Rosie? So this was just generally unrest. Um, we just wanted to know what people thought about that. But um, we should also ask them, was it actually you know, how likely did they think food was going to be a partial cause of that? I think it's really hard to um, to specify that, isn't it? Because sometimes if there's a sort of problem with food, it can cause a general sort of dissatisfaction. But then the specific trigger for the unrest could be something completely different. So I think that's quite a difficult one to to sort of draw out. Um, and we didn't go into that in this study. So that's a, a very good question, Rosie. Thank you. Excellent. OK. So I'm going to go to the next slide and just highlight some of your colleagues um, so you can see Christian Reynolds um, there and Tim Lang and others um, that were part of this study and, and, and took part in the survey. OK, so if food causes civil unrest, why do you think it is? So if we're looking at a 10 year time frame, do you think it's likely that food causes unrest because there is not enough calories in the UK? Or do you think it's more likely to be because um, we just couldn't get the food to the to the right people, um, for example, geographically isolated um, because of some event that caused um, us not to be able to move stuff around? So I'm looking for a, an answer now, whether it's one or two. Uh, I can see some twos coming in here. Base. Okay, it's pretty unanimous. Okay, so you're saying that you think there's, oh, well, Elizabeth thinks there might not be enough food and Claire, but um, cost, absolutely. Um, and we could argue that there's some issues with that at the moment as well. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so whether it's geographically, um, I suppose, yeah, there's a question of how much that correlates with, um, with food insecurity. Thanks, Corinne, for bringing that up. Great point. Okay, so I'll reveal what the, the people we surveyed um, thought about that. They basically agreed with you guys that it's more likely to be a problem with food distribution. And so, yes, a big question about whether there's enough calories or whether it's actually sufficiently nutritious. And we know that that's already a problem uh, in this country. Thanks, Catherine. OK, what about in the next 50 years? What do you think the answer would be? So we're saying there's been civil unrest. It's, it's because of food. And what was the what was the food system cause? Was it because there was not enough calories in the UK, number one, or was it because we couldn't get the food um, to the right places? I've got a few one and twos. That's what I like about using a chat feature for this sort of thing. Um, there's still a, quite a few twos. Oh, interesting about shoplifting. Yeah, excellent. OK, so we've got quite a lot of twos and both. OK, so the food system um, experts that we surveyed for this, and I know there's a lot of food system experts. I can see some names there uh, in the chat, uh, a lot of you. So um, in, in the survey that we did back in May, 
then um, actually more than half thought that it would be because there wasn't enough food in the UK. Um, and uh, Luke's highlighted there, it could be shortages of particular items, which, which we could get on to in a moment. Um, we will get on to. So we also asked about that, um, about what sort of item would it be that would be causing civil unrest? And so it was the popular carbohydrates. So we specified bread, pasta and cereal in that list, um, which people thought was the most important um, and less likely to be something to do with meat or fish or dairy and eggs. And of course, we have had salad shortages, um, tomato shortages um, over the last couple of years at, at specific times due to weather in Spain. Um, and I was at a meeting where someone said, who's, who's writing about that? The people who eat salad and tomatoes. So, you know, it's, it's you know, we've also got to think about the demographics of who's eating what and what's likely to, to really um, upset people and maybe focus on those. That's really why, why I wanted to ask this question. And I think also for me, what's interesting about this is that, you know, we might not have enough bread, pasta and cereal. And we saw some of that during COVID, but actually we might have plenty of oats, potatoes, barley, things that we do grow in the UK, um, but that maybe have less processing or are less popular. Um, so there might be something that's not, not as, as dramatic as panicking, but actually, you know, maybe about education, about other, other carbohydrates that we can eat instead, for example. Interesting about the protein content, Andrea. I'm going to come back to that one. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, and then we just wanted to put that together into a bit of a diagram of, of you know, what, what would be the cause of those different types of food um, distribution or shortages and problems. And so extreme weather and ecological collapse came top for people. The thickness of the line here shows you the number of people that chose this option. So unsurprising. Um, and trade restrictions was a, was a close, um, what was it, was a third um, option that, that was popular. So this is, you know, maybe some pointers as to what to really focus on next. Um, yes, thanks, Ursula. That's a great point. Yeah, so I think that there's some really interesting, um, yeah, really interesting sci-fi. In fact, I was, was talking to somebody the other day who was um, explaining that apparently if you're going to be a judge in a court case, there's a bunch of um, fiction books that you need to read. There's a reading list to understand about different people's lifestyles and different um, types of um, uh types of people and they may have to you know be passing sentence over and so we were speculating should there be sort of a reading list for you know um uh fiction um including science fiction for different types of um uh, you know societal breakdown um that we should all be studying as well um, in order to learn from from the people who have really spent quite a lot of time thinking about this in some detail thanks ursula um what do we mean by road computing? Um, so that would be something like AI taking over, um, or it could be also um, viruses. Um, it could be uh, using computers in a sort of warfare kind of um, way, um, which we've seen a little bit as well. What is coronal mass ejection? Um, coronal mass ejection is where we get um, get um, turbulence on the the outer. Sorry. Um, Previously an astrophysicist, I should have admitted, so I'll restrain myself from giving an astrophysics lecture on this, but it's disturbances on the surface of the sun that, that fire particles towards the Earth, which then tunnel in and then cause um, uh, cause electricity um, uh, problems, basically. So this also links to electricity supply fa failure, um, which is um, also an issue. Excellent. OK, I'm going to move on to the... Um, Final slide on this topic, um, which is just to say, what, what should we do next? So we had quite a few people suggesting that we um, survey different constituencies. So um, Christian Reynolds, um, your colleague at City, is looking at, at doing a, a survey of farmers, for example. It was also suggested to do a sort of more European wide version of this. Um, but I'm really interested in, in how we then, you know, prepare for this. And I know there's a lot of work already going on. And Tim Lang has been working on this for, for years, your colleague at, at City, of course. Um, so Tim's currently working on a report to the National Preparedness Commission, um, which, um, which is one to watch out for. And also the fourth climate change risk assessment, which is going to be a lot more focused on, on policy and um, how we actually deal with different risks, as well as just um, sort of detailing what the risks could be. Um, but you know what 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 can we do in terms of working across sectors to try to 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 help people prepare and to share best practice so if you've got ideas on that i'd really love to hear from you um great okay i'm going to quickly run over some some basics on personal choices and we might fit in one or two questions and answers again 
So I don't need to tell this audience um, that food contributes about one third of all climate change. And um, I don't need to tell you what um, different processes contribute to that uh, total. But um, as you know, if we even if we stop burning fossil fuels, then we'll still have this most of this contribution from food, which is not connected with fossil fuels and that food alone is on track to cause uh, nearly two degrees of warming by the end of the century, even if we stop burning fossil fuels. So I'm preaching to the choir here, I know. So if we take um, one example of an eight ounce steak and chips, um, compare it with a microwave potato and beans, how different do you think the climate impacts would be? So um, well, I, don't, I don't need to ask you which causes more climate change, I'm guessing that. So how different do you think they are? Do you think it's maybe two times um, bigger for the steak and, and chips? Or do you think it's um, like 10 times, 100 times? I've got some numbers coming in um, from James there. Thank you. James is going for 20. Ben. Oh, hi, Ben. Uh, it's going for um, 10, uh, 15, 10. Excellent. Five from Susan. 30. Yeah, it depends. Oh, very good. Depends on where the beef comes from. I like those comments the best. Excellent. Yeah, so this is for a European average uh, beef. Um, so it's not the global average, but it's the European average. Otherwise, I couldn't fit it on the slide. Um, so there's a lot of expertise in this room because you're basically all on, on, on track within the range that you anyway get for different production systems. So that's fantastic. Um, so when I do this talk to um, a uh, layperson audience, then the factors come in, you know, maybe twice, twice as big, that kind of thing. Um, and so you can see here it is roughly about a factor of 20 for this European average steak. Um, it's not beans, uh, meat versus beans, it's animal production. I need to think more about what that question says. Sorry, Roxana, I need to read it more carefully. Um, so uh, this is, um, put it in the Q&A if, if we want to come back to that. Um, so this is a, a paper that Christian Reynolds uh, pointed me to um, a while ago, really illustrating what happens when you ask a layperson this question, which is that the estimate is roughly in the right direction, but it, they, people tend to massively underestimate the scale of the difference between different types of activity and different types of food. So this graph is relatively flat um, compared to where it should be along this diagonal line if people were, were correctly estimating the differences. And we could look at um, different choices for how we produce the the potato as well um, how we how we're going to cook that potato so um, i'm not going to ask a question about this but have a think how different do you think it is if you cook this uh, potato in an oven with lots of cheese and butter and beans versus um, uh, with modest amount of cheese and beans or microwaved so um, have a think about that and I shall reveal the answer here. So this is this is if we all halved our average amount of emissions, that would be our daily budget. But if we're going to have loads of cheese and put the oven on for two hours um, to cook one potato, um, which I probably did very smugly when I first started investigating this topic, um, then actually we'd be well, well over our budget for the whole day. Um, and we might as well have had, um, you know, an animal based product like chicken, for example, um, and had, had less emissions from that. So on the other hand, if we were to cook this um, potato in the microwave, then it'd be much lower than that. And um, a more um, thorough study um, was done, um, uh, which Christian Reynolds uh, uh, supervised, which was um, looking at different um, cooking times through surveying people, how they cook different things. And you can see for potatoes, particularly that the cooking could be up to 60 percent of the climate emission that the, the impact on the climate but actually um, for meat and fish it tends to be a smaller percentage but still a larger amount just because this this scale here is very different on this graph for meat and fish what with the impacts being higher great okay and as as everybody knows on this call land the way that we use the land is an extremely important part of how we um, prepare for a net zero um, for example this uh, graphic by the climate change Committee on Climate Change, which has uh, land use change as being a really important um, part of that budget. So on average, for the global average, animal products um, use about 16 times the area of land compared to plant based products for the same amount of calories, not the same amount of nutrition as was raised earlier. And uh, this was quite a controversial plot from the um, uh, Nimbleby food strategy, but I think still uh, very important um, to illustrate that the amount of land that we use overseas uh, for producing uh, food as well as in the UK. 
So how can we then play around with this? And so we've been working on a project um, within the Strategic Priorities Fund. I know um, there's many people on this call who have involved in some of these projects. And this is just a list of all the, the projects here which um, have been funded from that and also the, um, uh, the PhD um, Centre for Doctoral Training as well. And so I'm part of the Fix Our Food project, which is about transforming um, food systems to regenerative food systems in Yorkshire. Um, and this also is um, working with City and colleagues in City, Rebecca and Chris. Um, so this is um, looking, for example, at different ways of farming. So looking um, at, at these aeroponics, um, and I know India um, Langley is also based at City um, and is uh, a, a big part of this as well. So there's also looking at regenerative agriculture um, in the field and field trials led by Leeds. Um, and our part of this um, is looking at metrics and trying to produce a dashboard which will allow people to play around with different food system interventions. So if you go to this um, uh, website, then you'll be able to actually play around with it yourself. Um, so this is just um, showing you the climate impact of food consumed in the UK um, as a function of time, um, extrapolating the current diets with population growth after 2020 using the FAO stat data. And so you can see that if you, for example, change um, the amount of um, meat free days that we have in the week, then unsurprisingly, we can make a massive difference to our greenhouse gas emissions if we would have four animal product uh, free days in the week. Um, but you can play around with those and, and, and reduce waste, for example, here and look at um, the current UK production um, in terms of the, the actual calories produced in the UK. Um, per, per person per day are relatively um, large compared to our daily requirement of 2,500. But we, we, we also import food, but then we export and actually use some of that food to feed animals, as you know. So this is sort of showing how things add up and you can play around with these graphs for different settings on this um, intervention side. And also we can look at land use change. So this is showing a map of the UK, showing the pasture land in orange and the cropland in yellow. And then we can look at, for example, if we were to repasture um, three quarters of the, um, the, the low quality ALC45 pasture land and, and reforest that, we'd have this area of the UK roughly going green and we'd also sequester um, a significant amount of carbon, which you can see here. So this is sort of an advert um, and we're really interested in your thoughts on, on how we can improve that and particular interventions that you'd like to see in there. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and then I get asked this uh, quite a lot because we we love doing uh, as a group of us uh, take a bite out of climate change um, co-founded with Christian Reynolds that uh, yes I'll to share the slides um, which is looking at outreach um, and public engagement and so I get asked this question a lot you know if we engage people with information are we going to get dietary change and, and the research says the answer is no so why do we do any of this so why should we do any of this um, well actually um, what we really need is systemic change, which is going to support dietary change, but actually um, we need engagement with this information to get an appetite for policy change. So we get Rishi Sudak, for example, um, you know, making a joke almost of, of the meat, the potential meat tax, uh, which we know would be deeply unpopular. And I'm not, I'm not proposing we have one particularly, but for example, we couldn't have a sugary drinks tax that was publicly accepted if we didn't also have a public awareness that sugary drinks and sugar was causing um, massive health problems in the UK. So if we look at things like smoking um, a seat belt, um, ban uh, seat wearing seat belts, um, you know, there has to be a, an engagement with information that happens before we can get um, policy and systemic change, in my opinion. And so we're creating lots of resources that we've had great fun going around um, doing, for example, at the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition. And you can uh, don't get addicted to this now, but this is um, a link to a game that you might uh, find helpful to share with people that you're, you're doing outreach with. Um, and also these food flashcards, which uh, have a, uh, a great fun um, playing around with these, really illustrating um, the greenhouse gas emissions of different types of food. And there's, there's 72 different cards that you can use in your outreach. And our latest um, uh, product, as it were, we've had we, we got these uh, we made these pizza boxes which have got sort of um, different topping choices and worksheets inside. And we actually bought actual pizza boxes um, that 
but then there's actually no pizza inside it so the kids loved it but some of them were disappointed that there was no pizza inside it so maybe there's a lesson there somewhere about not making it too realistic um but the kids had great fun um and really were saying they were surprised how much difference it made to have different topics um and so this is something that's all downloadable on our website and, and we really encourage you to to play around with but more you know on a more sort of um uh strategic question is how should we be doing food climate literacy? What audiences should we be doing this with? Um, should we be getting it more into the, the curriculum, um, helping teachers to see where the existing curriculum um, does match onto this topic? Um, and how can we get more joined up thinking across government, for example, um, between DEFRA and the Department for Education? Um, and how to you know, get funding to do this kind of work um, uh, without uh, having conflicting interests, as we saw, there was some interesting discussion of this topic on the ultra processed foods uh, recent, in the last couple of weeks. Um, and on that topic, I think a really relevant um, activity that's going on at the moment is this food data transparency partnership eco working group. Um, so this is one of the tangible things to come out of the government's um, response to the Dimbleby um, independently commissioned national food strategy um, was to create this food data transparency partnership which brings together different food system actors to try to um, agree on next steps for um, climate particularly and environmental reporting generally and so to really get more consistency and agreed methodologies across different um, sectors and to to embed that into for example the scope three emissions process um, and so uh, one of these that I'm particularly interested in is to have a mandatory methodology for voluntary food eco labels. So I'd love to see a mandatory food um, climate impact labels. But in the meantime, we need to all agree on the methodology. And so this is a really important step forward, which needs to be done before we can have mandatory um, climate impact labels or at least, you know, put available information available at the point of sale, even if it's not on the packet. So this really important progress, I think, that's been made in this group, and this is an advisory group um, to DEFRA, so then it has to still go through the, the internal process if it's going to be signed off. But there's a, at least an agreement on, on which, um, which standard should be used, this GHG protocol, Scope 3 standard, um, and to use um, some of the work that's been done in RAP on, on some detailed emission factors for that. Um, so I'm happy to discuss that more if you're interested. Um, but just before I close, I'm just going to advertise uh, some work that we've been doing, um, which is um, leading a project called the Agri-Food for Net Zero Network. So this was um, a grant that several of us applied for, um, well, many of us applied for um, about oof, two years ago now. Um, and we started about a year ago. And the, the goal was really to, to bring together food system stakeholders with academics to inform the work of academics um, and create new connections that hadn't been made before, but also to, to pull, pull that together to advise UKRI on how they should um, fund this topic in the next 10 years. And so there's a large number of people involved in this. I won't, won't read out all the, all the names, um, but um, and a lot of project partners involved in this. And um, the year one champions are just coming to a, an end at the moment and br bringing together their reports, including um, the brilliant India Langley, who you, a colleague of yours. So um, and brilliant to also work with a number of people across um, the UK um, in this early career board, which um, is, uh, is has been a really amazing interaction, actually one of the highlights, I would say. Um, and so there's a newsletter which anybody can sign up to. Um, so there's a there's, membership is free. Anybody can join. You'll get a newsletter. You'll get invited to the webinars um, and events like the Big Tent event that's coming up in March. Um, and uh, we just actually last week ran a, a experimental networking meeting where we invited a thousand people to a Zoom, uh, which was um, a little bit um, scary but um, a lot of fun um, getting people into breakout rooms and meeting each other for the first time so we'll be doing more of those and one thing that's coming up in the near future um, in the next few days is um, a uh, report on different scenarios for the food system in 2050 um, which i won't go into detail on now um, but do join up um, and uh, and and capitalize on the sort of connections that you can make with different food system stakeholders that you might not have met before and I shall uh, leave this slide up since Rachel has kindly asked for more details where to sign up. You can see the URL there or I'll attempt to type it into the chat at some point. Um, brilliant. I'm going to stop there. 
Um, and I'm going to, um, looking forward to, to the question and answer, and I shall stop sharing my slides and uh, I can put them up again if we need them. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Sarah. What a fantastic overview of um, a huge number of pieces of work that you're doing at the moment. Um, we've got some great questions in the chat. Please do, everyone, keep popping them into the Q&A uh, rather than the chat. Sorry, pop them in the Q&A. Uh, we will hopefully share your slides, Sarah. I think that you said yeah. yes, that would be OK. So the details for how to sign up to the newsletter will be on that, though. I can see you've just posted it into the chat now, Sarah. So that's great. So the first question we've got is from Ben Dare. Um, can the Fix Our Food online calculator show details for Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland? The map showed, I think, just England. Yeah, that's a great question, Ben. Yeah, that's definitely our aspiration. It's not possible at the moment for the land use part. Um, the, the overall uh, consumption practices is the FAO stat data, which is UK. Um, but the land use, we've only read in the um, agricultural land classification data for, the, for England so far, and it's a slightly different format for the different devolved administrations. So that's on our list. Thanks, Ben. Excellent. So Katrin Prager has another question. So do your tools research only focus on optimising diets or production and land use for climate change and greenhouse gas emission reduction? Or do you also consider biodiversity and trade offs between the two? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, we're looking at um, a number of metrics, not biodiversity at the moment, though, um, because my understanding, and please correct me, is that it's not fully agreed really exactly what's the best uh, metric to use for biodiversity. Uh, but we are looking at, at land use, for example, um, and nutritional um, quantities as well. Um, but I think, and, and this is relevant to the Food Data Transparency Partnership as well, that, that um, this came up a few times that you know we shouldn't just be looking at climate impacts but i think what we've agreed on that is that really getting um some of those um there's a lot of um passing information down the supply chain and, and connectedness that needs to happen in order to do the climate impact calculations and by just pushing forward on that you actually get a lot of infrastructure in place which will make it much easier to do the other things so that is that, that's the sort of thinking that I kind of do subscribe to um, on the basis that there is a reasonable amount of overlap between um, some of the different environmental indicators. But the more that yeah, it would be great, be great to do biodiversity, definitely. Yeah. Do you think there's any role for um, that to then be better linked up off the back of the partnership? You know, I know it's all voluntary now. So is, is like what is likely to happen on the back of it not being mandated? Yeah, I think that you need, I mean, I suppose even with the, the nutrition labels, which are debatable, I know, but um, even with the nutrition labels, there had to be this, you know, this um, voluntary methodology um, for quite a while before people were really sort of on board and businesses were really on board with the idea of making it mandatory. And so I think that's the reason why I think I skipped over the slide showing all the different industry players that are actually um, involved in the Food Data Transparency Partnership to try and, you know, get that level playing field and that buy in from across industry, which which needs to happen to, to do that. So yeah, I don't know how long it will take, but it feels like it would be this has to happen first. So I'm going to be glad of that. Yeah, great. I have a question, actually, that I'm going to ask as a, the chairs, just because it's on that same topic of sort of data and labelling. Was there any talk in the Food Data Transparency Partnership about uniting uh, an eco label with a, a health label? And, you know, how, how close are we to that? Uh yeah, no, not 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 significantly. So I think there's there's sort of questions about whether we want a sort of overall um, environmental number, which includes a, a few different environmental factors. But I'm tr I don't recall there being a discussion about combining with the nutritional um, part. Yeah, mm, it seems like a missed opportunity about. to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose I suppose this is sort of a similar sort of issues that you have with the environment that different people have different values and, and priorities around these different things. So um, so you're sort of almost having to second guess what that should be for people. But yeah, it'd be great if it was possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so and the next question from Andrea Zip is how do you see the lack of impact or least limited impact of traffic light labelling on purchasing patterns in the context of the potential introduction of climate labelling? And will it have the desired impact? Yeah, that's a great question, Andrea. Um, so for me, it, it, 
<laughs> it isn't really about the impact that it'll have on its own. Um, so yes, yeah, so for example, the nutrition labels, I know there's research showing that people don't really understand what the existing labels are. Um, but actually, when you look at the impact that it has, then it has a lot bigger impact than just whether people are changing their purchases based on the label. So for example, if we look at, um, there was a, a change in the traffic light um, boundary between orange and red, um, I think it was on sugar in Canada. And what happened was that they gave a six month warning for that to happen. And actually the food manufacturers reformulated so that none of them ended up being put into that red category. So I think you can have a really um, powerful effect on the food producers through that. But also if we're looking later steps, you couldn't have, as I say, a, a sugary drinks tax without an agreed um, you know, methodology for reporting sugar. Um, so, you know, maybe not a meat tax, but, you know, we could have some sort of financial incentive related to climate impacts, whether it's a tax or a subsidy or something else um, to be determined. But you couldn't have any of those things if we didn't have um, an agreed number on the packet. So for me, it's not really about so much people changing their choices, but you could have maybe syntheses of, um, you know, by, by journalists, for example, be better informed to talk about this sort of thing as well. Mm. It's really interesting. Um, I'm at the FENS conference at the moment, Federation for European Nutrition Societies, and Walter Willett, the keynote speaker this morning, talked about exactly that for trans fat, is that industry wouldn't move, weren't moving with trans fat, and then uh, labelling, mandatory labelling came in, suddenly trans fat came out. So I think you're right, oh, it can I actually really, really shift, <laughs> shift in the right direction. Um, yeah, so there, Rosie uh, Osborne has a question about where will the report be published? I'm not sure which report you're oh, she's maybe referring the agri -food, to. Maybe the agri-food for net zero one that I mentioned at the end. I'm just wondering if it was that, then um, it's going to go out to our newsletter and go on our website. So it's it's not a journal thing, but it will be um, you know, publicly available. Soon? Um, yeah, it was supposed to be like any day now. So yeah, I did actually just check before today to check it had actually gone out or not. Yeah. Excellent. So anticipate that to, to be published imminently. Um, now we've got Ursula Ahrens, who says, comments, please, on huge debates on um, GWP figures for methane, <sighs> GWP 100 and GWP versus GWP. Thanks, Ursula. Yeah, that's the uh, yeah, that's a big one, as you know. Yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> so. OK, so just to summarise, for people not familiar with this, so different um, metrics that we could use to quantify greenhouse gas emissions. One weights different greenhouse gases by some factor. Another looks at the time variation of the greenhouse gases, um, because that actually is the thing that relates to the um, average Earth surface temperature. Um, so it's you know really um, crucially important that we do monitor the Earth's surface temperature, and that is the metric that's been used in the, um, the for example, the Paris Agreement. Um, but actually, the total amount of energy captured by the Earth system um, is also a really important metric. And, and one of the things that happens, as people on this call will know, is that we get ocean recirculation, which means that actually we're heating up the bottom of the ocean, and they help to keep the surface temperature relatively constant, um, even when we get more mass, more energy injection. So I think that we also we should actually be looking at whether we're looking at the right metric for um, you know global warming. And I think if we were actually to take into account the energy being caught by the Earth's atmosphere, um, then we would actually be closer to the, to the uh, GWP 100. Um, so that's a, a really interesting question. But I actually still think that GWP 100 is is a really important metric since we do care about heating up the bottom of the ocean as well. Great, thank you. Um, so Teresa Senna says, do you work with or know any metric which calculate how eco is a food based on the use of pesticides or even projects aiming to put this information onto a food label? I can answer that question very quickly, <laughs> just no. <laughs> um, so that's an interesting question and I don't know the answer and I'm not gonna try. So, so area for future research for sure. Yep. So an anonymous uh, attendee has said, what's the current research data on the possible impact uh, behaviour on consumers when seeing environmental labels? And, you know, what does this data tell us so far? Yeah, so there was some really nice work done, um, led by um, Oxford, um, the LEAP uh, project in Oxford, which was looking at um, caterers putting this onto their menus, um, at the, the greenhouse gas emissions onto their menus. Um, and looking at the impact it had on people making decisions and also some, um, yeah, yeah. So this particular study found that there was not actually as big a, an effect as people 
sort of thought there was going to be. Um, but actually, it turned out that a lot of the caterers, when they were doing the labels, then actually reformulated because they were so shocked at seeing some of the labels. So you can argue whether or not that was a successful um, uh, study. But actually, if you're talking with caterers and, and they're having to put these numbers again, it's this back to this sort of um, impact it has on the producers. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Andrea Zick has a response to your response to her question, which says, yes, I agree, the impact is likely to be with the producers or wider th through wider policy changes. So just relevant to the recent question as well. Jocelyn Cornwall says, um, can you say more about the impact or lack of impact on public information for making change in behaviour and the connections you were making to the systemic changes that are needed? Yeah, so I think this is this sort of comes back to what we can learn from previous um, systemic changes that have happened and that are totally, you know, on board with the fact that we need systemic change. Um, and if we look at something like, uh, for example, um, smoking ban in pubs, um, then we can see that there was a real uh, uh, a real p pattern of work that went into that you know that we had to have public information we had to 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 try and get people on board with the idea and then there's a, a key moment when it comes in when it's you know it's it, it is unpopular with some people but you have to start that informational project much earlier and so i think that's really where where we're trying to get to with this um, outreach work that we're doing and how do we for example once we've now we've got it potentially um, an agreed protocol for greenhouse gas emissions reporting on food packets shouldn't we now be teaching that to um, in schools, for example, what does that mean? So how do we get that kind of information out that then supports that pathway towards the, 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 the later stages? So I think there's there's multiple different phases to this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it is. But we the, the challenge with that is that we need to move quickly. Yeah, right. So we can't have like multiple phases over the next 10 years because we're going to be we're going to be too late. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So how do we move at pace? Um, so thank you very much. I have another question for you, which is around uh, what the next step is on the civil unrest work. So you you listed a few options and, you know, obviously throwing around a few ideas. But what do you do you have any concrete next steps and what you think it means for those of us working in food systems? Yeah, I mean, I think for me personally, it was very much about thinking, well, in my mind, it's gone from being, you know, a slightly crazy thing to be talking about to being, you know, we really need to do this thing. Um, we, we, we need to be engaging. I think really important point that Tim Lang has made is that we need to be engaging again across society. So if we look at the House of Lords uh, work that's been done on risk, I think it's been really important at criticising the government's approach to risk, um, which basically um, discounts uh, future risk. Um, as a function of time, but also prioritises based on the risk uh, assessment over the next two years, so that we end up basically ignoring things which are you know, risky on a longer time scale. So that was a really important um, uh, point that they made, but also the point that I think relates to the next steps is that we, we need to, to, to engage across society. It's the, 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 the job of dealing with you know, really major risks um, doesn't just lie with government because it would be quite inefficient if we relied entirely on government to be prepared for every possible eventuality, but that we we've got a huge capacity, for example, in community groups, um, which you know are ready and keen to engage. But again, you know, the House of Lords um, critique of the, the the government's risk approach was that way too much of it was actually classified, and that's that's recently been changed, which is a brilliant um, you know new updated version of the the risks. Uh, to declassify those to, to have a whole society approach to risk which is I think mm -hmm. you know a lot of the work that Tim's been doing has been about how do we engage with civil society as well so I think it's all pointing at a similar place. Yeah absolutely and also I guess the responsibility at various levels of government. Yeah. Yeah um, so Teresa Senna said my former question about pesticides comes from a place of worry since the food production with lots of pesticides, especially when it's used with GMOs, affects all aspects of healthy and sustainable diet. So health, environment, social, cultural, economic. She says, I'm from Brazil and the reality is that it's really hard here. Mm. Just wonder if you've got any extra comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I think that that is where you start to get into some trade-offs, certainly because if we're looking at the pesticide use, 
in terms of the climate impact it's it's really small but on the other hand if you're looking at for example rice production and you're looking at using paddy fields for rice which is you know quite bad for the environment in terms of the methane emissions um, we can grow rice perfectly well if we treat it like wheat and other grains um, and, and, and do it on a dry system but then you need to use more um, chemicals in terms of particularly the herbicides to you know, and the pesticides which which are otherwise solved by the um, the, the being underwater um, which reduces pests and, and competing um so i think i think that's a yeah it's an interesting one that starts to become a bit of a trade-off on that mm -hmm. um david finlay has a question by using these average figures there appears to be an assumption that production systems can't change after 25 years of traveling this eco ecological journey we are now independently audited as carbon positive uh, our planet biodiversity has increased by by 50 percent um, and we have 125 invertebrate species of which 77 are water beetles and our dairy farm output has remained the same yeah i think it's brilliant and i think that the, the you know part of so so it becomes a bit sort of chicken and egg doesn't it like do we talk about average values um, or do we just tell people it's really complicated? And so my um, personal belief is that we should talk to people um, and we should use average values in the first instance. But you'd be amazed actually how members of the public, when you show them a, a flashcard with one number on it, they ask, it, it can't just be one number. So that, that you know we shouldn't underestimate people's ability to understand that actually it's not just one value. Um, and absolutely, you know, the whole you know, my whole passion for there being a more detailed information per product is so that we can reward the producers who are doing an amazing job like like you're talking about um, so that those those products are not just, you know, blanket, you know, sort of um, penalised, for example, um, just due to due to the type of product it is, for example. Great, thank you. Uh, so Anda Zabala has is asking, what are your views on the recent pushbacks from local authorities in removing meat dairy from their menu? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really interesting one for, um, um, for example, for school caterers as well, isn't it? And, um, you know, we've, there's been a few cases where schools are brought in meat free Mondays and there's been, and, and in France as well, it's been big pushback from parents that, that the children are being deprived of nutrition and that schools are trying to cut, cut costs. Um, so I think that this really, again, you know, it's, it's a really great example of a systemic, systemic change that we need to have happen in terms of reducing quantities um, of animal products on, on menus. Um, but if you don't have that informational campaign, um, which, which at least educates people on maybe sometimes average numbers, um, but that we, we then can make it easier for then those systemic changes to come in. And, and we, we need to, as you say, need to do that quickly, Christina. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now we have a, a, an anonymous attendee who said, what do you think the biggest different, what do you think are the biggest differences in risk to supply chains between the rural and urban areas? Right. So, I mean, I think this is um, one of the, one of the, I'm actually going to bring up the slide about that because we did ask that question and I didn't really talk about it very much in terms of the different types of um, causes that you could have um, for different, oh, where's the button, share screen. That's the one, yeah, share reading view. Get the button. Yeah, here we go. So in terms of the different, um, what the food system expert said in terms of the likely causes of food distribution problems um, would be things like, it could be extreme weather. So you could have whiteouts, you can have, obviously we've got um, quite a lot of flooding. I'm in New York at the moment and uh, you can't actually use the river path. It's like under about a metre of water. Um, but we can also have, um, we've got the, the, the um, at the other end of the spectrum, we've got buckling of roads and railway lines due to extreme weather. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with the extreme weather um, type of thing. And then I suppose trade restrictions, that, that's less relevant to your point about the rural um, areas. But for example, if we had other issues with um, workforce for lorries um, and uh, you know getting the food along the roads again is another another major issue. So I think I think I would pick transport as a really, really big one on that. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. The solutions are by default likely need to, to be diverse, don't they, to, to match mm. the needs of the different areas. Um, Jocelyn Cornwell has a question. Thank you for the answer regarding my question about public information. The panel is, the parallels with smoking are really interesting. Wasn't it the ban on smoking in public areas that brought about the big changes in the smoking patterns? And did it need decades <laughs> of warnings to prepare the ground? Oh dear, it's depressing, isn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's it's been a massive change, isn't it? It's um it's really hard to believe now that we'd all come home reeking of smoke in the evenings from from sitting in a pub, and uh, and now it's just it's just the way that life is. Yeah, I I have to say, you know, I don't want to be depressing, and I should be kind of positive at this point in in the <laughs> this seminar probably, but you know, I suppose five years ago I was very much focused on thinking about how. Um, different foods contribute to climate change and we just need to get you know information out there and get the systemic change and um, I suppose the reason why I'm now interested in civil unrest <laughs> is because I'm not totally sure we, we're getting there so it's I think, um, yeah it's happening and you know we we now need to reduce the you know the shock of the the the, the bad things that happen but I, I also believe very much in the sort of build back better I mean I know we're currently sort of building back fast as, as I think Tim Benton would say but um, you know I think we do need to work on both sides of these things at the same time and they can actually work together in the sense that if we do have a food crisis um, in the next 10 years which causes major civil unrest then we will need to do something differently and so mm. I think it's still worthwhile doing this work on on the, the climate impacts but we also need to be doing the other the mitigation sorry the preparation side as well. Yeah, absolutely. Play play both games. Christian Reynolds has a, a question. So you're, um, I know ultra processed foods is quite a hot topic at the moment, but do you have any thoughts on the role of processing in the food system to lead to net zero diets or and or resilient diets in either the UK or globally? <laughs> Thanks, Christian. Yes. Yeah. So. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so I guess, well, we wrote this paper, didn't we, on the on ultra processed foods. Um, and the connection between that and climate impacts in Brazil. And certainly we found that the there was a, a big correlation between the climate impacts and the level of processing. Um, however, that was largely due to the fact that a lot of the ultra processed foods were um, quite um, beef um, heavy or meat heavy. So, for example, sausages would come into that category. Um, so then, uh, then if we're getting beyond that question about the, the ingredients in those ultra processed foods, um, and we're thinking about, you know, actually processing processing is not necessarily a bad thing um and I, I find that's quite a controversial uh thing to say sometimes that you know for example i'm a big fan of um buying uh, already roast already baked potatoes and you buy them frozen and i mean that sounds like i'm sure my grandparents are probably turning in their graves that i'm saying this out loud i can't be bothered to switch the oven on to cook a, a, a baked potato but actually you know cooking things in bulk is an awful lot more efficient and will reduce the cooking impacts so um you know processing itself is not a bad thing however ultra processing obviously we're talking about um, ingredients that we don't necessarily know the health impacts of those so there's a bigger issue there which um, we need to understand and you know th there is a worrying side to that as well definitely mm -hmm. so it's, it's often seen we should all be like scrubbing our potatoes i went through a phase of scrubbing all my potatoes and you know baking bread and you know and all this all these things that we all did in lockdown i guess but uh, you know we're all busy people and actually you know buying something that someone else has mass processed for you is is a huge time saver and tins of beans for example i, I didn't use those at first because i thought well, the packaging is really bad i should be boiling up my beans overnight but you do the calculation it's actually really not bad the, the tins all um, recycled and it's really great people really love to hear that they can you know do something easy like add it to their beans and therefore bulk out their you know meal to be healthier but also reduce the animal products while keeping much of the same ingredients as opposed to starting an entirely new cuisine yeah i i guess it's about the nova classification isn't it and that's not saying that processing per se you know there's there's unprocessed processed culinary processed you know and then there's the ultra processed which is about as you said not having ingredients that you would have in your gear kitchen and and the extra additives that we really don't well understand yeah. um i think the the worry there is about the niche products that we're moving away from meat isn't it so i think that's the the meat alternatives so which usually are upfs yeah, so I suppose that there's this whole, well, there's a whole industry, obviously, isn't there, of, of plant-based meat alternatives. And if you say to somebody, we need to reduce animal products, then people will think about needing to switch to those products. But as I'm sure most people on this call are well aware, there are many wonderful foods out there, including tins of beans, which um, are nothing to do with any of that. So, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, another question from Hilda Mulrooney. She said, my understanding is that the swing towards agreement with the ban on smoking in closed public places was when the public understood that secondhand smoke harmed non-smokers. There's so much information about the harms of climate change for us all. I wonder what other things that might resonate most with the public in terms of that messaging. 
Mm, that's a great question. Yes, I remember that now. What was his name? Roy Castle or somebody who was uh, the trumpet player, Guinness Book of Records guy who got got, got um, tragically got cancer. And, and that was all about the passive smoking side of things. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think that um, and this sort of animal rights sort of side has, has been a, something that's gone on for a long time. And I suppose that's about um, the animals rather than people. So maybe less, less um, going to reach a, a large number of people. Um, I suppose what's happened with the fossil fuels and cars, I think, I think I'm noticing that there's a lot more focus on air pollution. So, so, so this and also, you know, methane from pig farms, for example, and, and methane from farming generally is a really, really big contributor to air pollution. So that might be something which has a bit more of a resonance for people, perhaps, than the, the climate impacts, which sometimes seem, uh, I suppose, they're random and they're long term, aren't they, which makes it a bit harder to get, get our heads around. Mm -hmm. Um, so another question here from Ben Dare. Has anyone explored the climate impact of storing bulk cooked foods, i.g. large scale cooking in the freezer for X amount of time versus cooking smaller batches, e.g. in the house, that you finish off more quickly and then use less energy to keep it frozen? Short versus how, short versus how efficient are freezers? Great question, Ben. Yes, this is right for a calculation, isn't it? So I think I did some back of the envelope calculations on this, but yeah, bottom line is, you know, how efficient is your freezer in terms of the, um, the the insulation that's in your freezer? How often are you opening your freezer? Um, so this is going to come down to, you know, is it a chest freezer? Is it a supermarket freezer, which is extremely efficient? But bottom line is freezers are remarkably efficient. I mean, the main energy you're putting in is that bit where you're reducing the temperature of that food down to minus 18. Um, if you're starting at room temperature, then that's really, um, you know, that's 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 a lot less energy than heating something up from room temperature to 100 degrees, particularly because it's a heat pump rather than um, actually burning electricity. So, yeah really quite efficient so um it's it's you know typically it's going to be better to to put, put a batch in the freezer than, than to do it separately yeah no absolutely uh christian has another rather indulgent question he says thanks for indulging me sarah um you have some policy makers watching tonight and citizens who can vote uh, what should the policy makers be taking away from your talk and what are the solutions that you want to see change what are the solutions to change you want to see implemented E I E. what should we be voting for great question yes uh, okay so i think um it depends how long term we want to go on this doesn't it like you know i, th I think that we have to have this information passed on to consumers so i think that we do need to have the labeling i do want to see a pathway to mandatory labeling um i would like to see a pathway for that to be you know an education campaign um, akin to the ones that we've had before before these big changes it, i think you know governments are worried about having nanny state and saying that we're going to tax this or we're going to you know remove this or whatever but but it doesn't mean say so they can they need to do nothing does it it, it means they need to have a, pl a pathway they need to have a plan um, and they need to have a vision for how they're going to get there so i think that it's it's really about making that that pathway and coming up with also you know a lot of the problems and I know we've got um, food uh, producers here we, we heard about the the dairy um, herd earlier on and you know there's a huge amount of uncertainty at the moment about what these incentive schemes are going to be in the long term um, and you know all these changes require big investments from food producers and they don't necessarily know um, if this, these schemes are going to be continue to run and they're, they're not you know you put the investment in and, and now and you don't necessarily get the benefit for five years and if the scheme's no longer happening then you've got to really worry about that so i think this is a consistency and, and long-term strategy which we we just completely don't have um you know one of the problems i think is that we don't you know it's hard to join these things up across government departments we don't have somebody whose brief it is to really focus on food we've got it spread across defra we've got health We've got education, we've got many different departments who are all, and Food Standards Agency, of course, who are all working hard, but they don't have that overall vision. So I think we need, you know, a food focus, um, a lead on food, basically, for the government as well. Here, here. Very well said. <laughs> Absolutely. I think many people listening tonight would be aligned with what, with what you've taken away. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. That's been an absolute excellent food thinkers. Lots of um, interaction with the audience, which has been excellent. So thank you, everyone, for staying with us. And uh, yeah, what a delight to hear such a, a breadth of work that you, you're doing at the moment. So thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Okay.
Good night, everyone. And don't forget to um, to join our December Food Thinkers. Uh, we've got uh, Sarah Pullen from Birmingham City Council. Thanks again, Sarah. Thanks Bye -bye. very much, everybody. Thank you.